Right, hello and welcome back to another video. Uh, today we're going to be having a look at uh, different ways we can spawn particles into our level. So uh, the basic two, spawn burst and spawn rate, um, and then specifically spawn per unit, um, and then sort of the equivalent um, other setup that works uh, in the same kind of way. So let's jump right in. Uh, I'm just going to start with a brand new uh, knife system. Just starting from the empty template. Can you keep things nice and simple? Um, just to keep things clear. Give that a second to build. Uh, there we go. Uh, NS, uh, and we'll call this class uh, spawn per unit. SPU, that'll do. Um, okay, so as I say, can you keep this nice and simple? Uh, and we're just going to have basic sprites. Um, but by default in the empty emitter we don't get any sprites, we don't have anything spawning. So in particle spawn we need to, oh no, in emitter update, there we are, uh, we need to add a spawn something. Um, default one, or one of the most common ones, is spawn rate. This is just a, a number of particles per frame. Um, if I give this a little bit of a reduced size, uh, maybe 10 is fine, maybe a um, location maybe see that a little bit better and maybe just a touch of gravity as well just so we can see things uh, we'll just add the forces and velocity and that to be a small amount there we are so we've got a small sphere and a bit smaller um, we have some gravity pulling our particles down uh, and we can see we're getting a number of particles over time uh, in our spawn rate so number of particles per second Larger number, more particles, easy. Um, that's fine if we want to just have a constant release of particles. Um, spawn burst, well, that does what it says. This is a number of particles at a specific time. So we get 50 particles and then we're done. Just a one time thing. Um, fine, makes sense, hopefully nice and easy. Uh, spawn per unit is slightly more complex. Um, so this works basically by checking how far the emitter has moved or the system has moved. So if you've got something where you're trailing along behind something uh, and you want to spawn particles, uh, it spawns one particle at every distance of the spawn spacing. So in this case, every 20 units or 20 centimeters in Unreal, uh, we would get a single particle. And we can't really preview that here because this isn't moving. Um, but if I bring that down and just grab that and bring it into the world, we can see as we move this around, we're getting particles spawning behind it. Uh, and we get this trail of particles that, um, that falls and does whatever the particles are, are told to do. Um, this is really useful. Uh, if we try a much higher number, we're going to get particles much more infrequently. Um, obviously a much lower number, we're going to get lots of particles. Uh, and this is really useful for systems that are moving where you want to have a constant release rate uh, independently of the speed of the particles. So the classic one is like a car exhaust. If you've got a car, obviously it can drive fast, it can drive slow, it can be fully dynamic, it can be different different shots. If you're doing cinematics, that kind of thing, um, you want your spawn rate to be constant. If your car drives too fast and your spawn rate doesn't adapt to that, what you're going to have is gaps in your particles. And if your spawn rate's really constant and your part, your car doesn't move, you're going to get loads of overdraw because you're spawning way too many particles. So spawn per unit's a really nice fix uh, for that kind of thing. Now, where this is also quite useful, uh, or whether it should be useful but there are problems, uh, are things like sword trails, uh, combat animations. Um, very common to have some kind of magical sword swing. You want to spawn particles, you want it to be dynamic based on the sword but there's some issues. So here we have the Greystone character. Uh, this is one of the Parable, uh, Paragon uh, character assets uh, freely available on the um, Epic uh, store. Uh, and I've just added it to a sequence. So if I open this up, um, and I'm just gonna delete the two I've already done and we'll just remake them. So here we go, uh, and let's yeah, fine, I'll add the animation in as well. So um, not gonna go too much into sequencer, there's other tutorials about that, but if you bring in the character, we're just gonna add an animation track. 
uh, and we want the ability E, I think it is. And that's this big looping sword swing. So quite a nice um, range of motion. Really good candidate for having like a sword trail behind it. Um, cool. So if I bring my class SPU and just drop that in here, um, what I want to do is I want to attach it to my greystone character. And it's going to give me this list of sockets. And there is one at the tip of the sword, uh, sword top. If we have a look, it's done that automatically for us, moved it into position. And when I scrub my, 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 uh, my timeline here, we see we get um, particles spawning on that trail. Um, now, you'll see a few gaps. Well, what's happening there? Well, if we look at the animation, it's actually moving very, very fast. There's a huge gap between here and there um, in terms of the distance the sword is traveling in a single frame. And it's very common in animation to have these things. When it's seen at full speed, you, uh, you see the, sort of the movement that isn't there. Um, and so you have these gaps in the animation uh, and it's hitting the limit of spawn per unit. Um, so if we go into our spawn per unit module, there's a maximum movement threshold. Now we can either just make this bigger, that'll be fine, or we can just disable it entirely for this example. Uh, and that's the idea with that is to stop it moving uh, or spawning particles when the particle kind of teleports or moves a really, really long distance. Uh, and we'll see that now. So if we go back to here on frame zero, if I click play, it's not doing it this time. Yeah, so you can see this kind of line of particles that comes in occasionally. Um, that's the attachment happening. So here the particle is unattached because the cinematic isn't doesn't exist, uh, and so the particle just sits at the world origin. And as it jumps into place, um, it now becomes visible, uh, but it's still doing that spawn per unit. So the maximum distance value is supposed to stop that that kind of spawning on jumping, um, which I mean does work but obviously uh, also causes those gaps in the big sword movements here. Um, easy enough to fix though, I'm just gonna only spawn this on, on frame one. Uh, and so rather than doing it there, if I do that, set that to frame zero and turn it off, and that should fix my issue. So I'm just ignoring that first frame. So the teleport and movement is happening and then it's attaching and trailing along. Okay. Um, so for simple particles like this, that would work fine. Um, they're just spawning and um, and falling. I might just make them sphere location slightly smaller. Maybe the particles can be a bit smaller as well. Not worrying too much about the visuals here. Um, there we go. Um, but if we start trying to add some complex movement to this, so let's say we want our particles to be fired outwards um, along our along our emitter. Well, if I go back into here, if I add a velocity, so on particle spawn, add velocity, and let's just do, I don't know, something in the x-axis, and we'll try 500 and see what that looks like. Oh, it's a bit fast. Is it the x-axis I want? Let's just have a look at my particle. Uh, well, let's rotate it. That's probably the best thing to do. Uh, I want to rotate this locally and rotate it 90 degrees. There we go. So now my particle emitter or my system is pointing along my sword. I want to fire my particles out. Um, and unfortunately, that creates a problem. Let's click play. Can you see we get these gaps? As the sword is jumping from frame to frame, the particle's velocity is being set. Um, let me just turn off gravity for a second. Um, but it's being set only on that one frame. And so the whole sort of chunk of particles uh, that spawn within that single sort of line uh, get fired out at a different velocity to the next chunk. And so it's become this kind of sort of quantized um, batches of particles in velocity. Um, so that doesn't really work. Um, so we need a better way to do this. Uh, very common with the sort of sword swing to get these kind of gaps, trying to use this technique. It doesn't really work. What can we do? Well, what we need is a particle velocity that's per particle. And so if I just jump over to Photoshop and draw this out, we have our character in the middle. That's what characters look like top down. And we have our sword, something like that. 
um, the trail, the arc that's going to sort of follow something like that. Um, and what we want is every particle, a different color, as a particle spawning on this trail, we want this direction. So we want the direction from the character outwards. And because this is a sort of central effect, um, we've got our, our sort of center point of our character and throwing the sword out. Um, we can just use the character's position and the particle's position to get this vector, to get this direction vector. Um, so let's do that. So if I go into here, turn off the add velocity, and I'm going to do another one, but I'm going to do it directly. So set new or existing parameters directly, and I'm going to um, set the velocity, so particle's velocity. Now in this case, if I what I want to do is I want to take the two positions away from each other and whenever you're taking directions um, well in this case what we want is the just the direction I then want to have a scale value on that so in this case if I take the two positions away I can normalize them to get just the direction vector and then multiply that by a value and that will give me sort of a speed factor um, that I can then multiply and scale up so uh, we'll do a multiply vector by float the vector is a normalize vector, and that is a subtract vector. Um, yeah, let's try this. Um, it might be we want to do this with position. They've added the position data type. Um, so to me, a position and a vector should be the same, but they're actually not treated the same here. But let's try this. So the particle position. Particle position doesn't come up as a um, an option as an input for a vector. You can drag and drop it, and it will give you a warning and convert it. And so they're treating positions and vectors as different data types, um, presumably to do with accuracy. Um, this is a new thing, but so let's not do subtract vector. Let's do subtract position and now I should have a position input and oh, this will give me two position inputs interesting okay well the position for one of my two positions here is going to be my particle position and for the second one what I want is the position of my character now we might need to do some blueprints or some code to do this in a sort of full development cycle um, but all I'm going to do is I'm going to just select where he is and copy these values manually so we're taking the world position of the uh, of the owner and we might be able to do this through the attachment you can do engine owner you want owner owner so the going from the system to the skeletal mesh that's carried that's that's it's um that's attached to um but that's for a different day what we're just going to do here like i say just grab this position so if we do uh, minus 370 minus 20. Now 20 here in Z, that's going to be where the character's feet are. Now if you're doing a sword trail, you probably want the sort of particles to be forced out somewhere around his chest. So if I just grab a, um, ooh, where's the thing, this, um, and let's just do a cube. Um, try and get the height. So something about what position is that? Somewhere around his chest. It's about 150. So we'll just use that as our Z value. So if I go back to here, let the autosave do its thing. Um, we can do this while it's doing it. Um, so taking position here, um, position here of our particle, position here of our character that's going to be code driven or blueprint driven, um, the distance or the one minus the other gives us the vector between them. We normalize that to just be a direction, and then we can multiply by a scale value. Uh, might be that you want to keep the vector unnormalized. If you had something where the sword went a long way away and you wanted to use that distance as part of your velocity, that might work. Um, but in this case, we'll just normalize it and then multiply by a value to give ourselves the control that we want. Okay, so rather than 20, which would be his feet, we'll do 150. And so we're calculating a velocity 
per particle based on the particle's position and the world space uh, and multiplied by a value. And let's just try something like 25 and see what happens. Um, go back to the beginning. And there we are. It's a little slow. Um, got my subtract the right way around. If your particles are moving the wrong direction, um, if you've subtracted one mind the other, the other way around, uh, you can either just swap the inputs or invert with a, mo a negative value here in your scalar. And now things should get attracted in towards him. There you are. So you can do other effects uh, that way. But if I just put this back to a, a positive value, what we should be able to see is there's no gaps anymore because the velocity of his particles is now completely radial based on that point. Um, apparently. And that works pretty well. Obviously, they need to scale the values, play with the, the way the, sort of the visibility and, and what these particles look like. But the uh, the velocity, the outwards velocity, uh, is now is now fixed. Uh, you will always get some straight lines between these things. Um, you can see here. Now, as the particles fire outwards, they become more radial. Um, the only way to really stop that is to have more frames in your animation, so slowing it down. Uh, but that might not work for the speed of the combat and that kind of thing. So there are definitely some limitations to this method. Um, and you can see there the straight line. If you jump back two frames, you're getting some quite straight lines there. But um, Cool. Well, firing outwards from the character is easy enough. Um, what happens if we wanted to have some kind of sort of spirally trail, something kind of the direction the sword was traveling, uh, or kind of like a trail behind the sword as it's traveling? Well, we can do the same thing, but we're going to do one extra step, uh, and that's we're going to use the cross product. So uh, if we try and, let's do this. So if we draw our guy in 3D, this will be uh, impressive for my 3D drawing skills. There's our character, and he has our sword, and it arcs around like this. What we have done is taken the positions here and here worked out that vector um, and that works for sort of firing things out radially uh, but we can do what's called the cross product so if we take our outwards vector what the cross product does is, is it takes two input vectors and it works out the third orthogonal vector so I'm bringing this into my camera so if you've got your direction you've then got a second vector uh, and it'll calculate your third vector so if you do your sort of axes thing with your fingers. Um, so in this case we've got this vector, we just calculated that. Uh, if we do a cross product with up with the world blue, um, what that will do will give us, if I should use green now with the right angle, uh, will give us this vector. So it'll give us the direction of travel of our sword or it'll give us the direction of trail whichever way we, um, whichever way we multiply it. So, um, so let's do that. Very simple, if I just take this module, and I'm just gonna do a copy and paste, and then disable the first one, um, taking the exact same vector, um, but rather than doing it here in normalize, if I cut, and then do cross, I can put the vector that I just cut out back in B, um, and I'm going to cross product it with world up, which is what the default is here. So zero, zero, 001. And what we should find is as we spin our character around and our particles go around, oh, that's probably the wrong direction. They're moving now in this kind of clockwise uh, clockwise way. If I go back to my system and use a negative speed. And now they're sort of trailing around. So you can get um, the same effect per particle based around the character to get that velocity uh, and that will give you that um, per particle velocity which stops this kind of breaking up from the spawn per unit um, which works quite nicely uh, if like me you're a stickler for detail I don't like negative values in terms of scales but we can always do the cross product with inverted axis so now we're cross producting with minus one in blue and that should give us the same that rotation around. Cool. Hopefully that makes sense. That's the uh, the fixes I've used before with spawn per unit. You get these gaps because your velocity is 
isn't isn't continuous all the way around so you just change your velocity to make sure it is uh, it works very well for this kind of character uh, based effect um, because we have this center point that we can base our velocities around so either radially or spirally or whatever um, however we want to do cool so that's it for the first part of uh, this video um, now we're going to do it an entirely different way so rather than using spawn per unit spawn per unit is based on distance um, we can do a spawn per time um, which sounds like a spawn rate but it's a little bit different so uh, I'm just going to take this and set the visibility to be false so we can't see it um, and we're going to start with a brand new emitter uh, start with an empty again uh, so this technique um, was mentioned by Deathray Online. Um, I think I've got all the features of it. Um, there might be a follow-up if there's some extra things that I've missed, but let's hope. Well, let's see what it does and see if it works. First release. Okay. So in this case, what we're going to do, rather than using spawn per unit or spawn rate, uh, we're actually going to spawn all of our particles on the first frame um, that the, the system is living. So we're going to do a spawn burst. Um, and I'm going to spawn, let's say, 250, something like that. We can always scale these values. I'm going to make them nice and small. Um, sprite size, uniform. Fine, that'll do. Uh, and we'll just leave them like that for now. So, what we're going to do? Well, as they're bursting, as they're spawning, I want to have a couple of parameters um, that I'm going to create in here. So, first thing, I'm going to create uh, a Boolean. Um, booleans are on or off, true or false, uh, and I'm going to call this one ooh, not per emitter, that's the wrong place, I want per particle, sorry about that. So in particle spawn, as a particle is spawned, let's do set new or existing, um, and we're going to do a boolean parameter, and it's going to be called has released, and this is going to start false, so the particles are going to start attached to the tip of the sword, and then as they go around, they're going to release off and fly off into the world. Now, th this is based on the timing. Uh, so what do I want to do is each particle wants a unique time. Uh, now, each particle does have a unique value. Uh, so I'll create a new float. And I'm going to do a multiply. Um, and in here, in the second one, um, it's an int, isn't it? Yes, so let's do multiply float by int. And in the integer input, we're going to do unique ID, return particle ID attributes. So as a particle is spawned, it is given uh, an ID value. Um, as particles more and more than are spawned, the value goes up. It's just a unique count of how many particles. And what that means is we can take that value, multiply it by a scale factor that we want, uh, and that's going to give us an incremental value that sort of we're going to use to check against time to release our, our particles. Um, there's a bit more in particle ID attributes, but you can sort of explore that yourself. So unique particle ID, that's our sort of particle count. Uh, and we want these to be released relatively frequently. Um, so let's just try 0.05 for now. So um, what's that? 20th of a second, first one, next one, next one, next one. So every 20th of a second, we're spawning a particle. Um, we will be. Um, so rename this, call it time to release. There we are. Okay. So now in update, we want to use these values. So I'm going to do a set new and existing parameter directly. Um, and I want to set, first of all, the um, has released parameter. And I'm going to do a comparison. So if we pull down here, set boolean by float comparison. So, all right, well, I want to compare the particle's time to release, time to release, uh, and I'm going to compare it against the emitter age. So how long has passed since the emitter was spawned? How old is it? If it's, I don't know, half a second old, well, if we're releasing one every 20 sec 20th of a second, then a few particles would have passed that value. And this is happening every frame. This is all an update. So now we've got a value that's going to start off, and then over time, become on and now we're going to use that to drive other parts of our, our particle system so let's do position that's the first and probably most important uh, particle position 
and we're going to set the value of particle position. Now, not to be engine simulation position, um, what we're going to do, and we're going to use this sort of process a few times, is we're going to lerp between two vectors, or in this case, lerp between two positions. Um, and the input for our lerp, our alpha, is going to be this Boolean. So if it's not released, it's going to be in one place. And then as it comes true, the alpha becomes one. And our lerp is then going to use the value in B rather than the value in A. So if I do a float, custom float from ball, the ball is has released. Uh, wherever it is, particles has released. Uh, and then if it's true, value of one, that uses input B. If it's false, value of zero, that uses input A. So it's just working a bit like a switch. Um, unfortunately, there isn't a if um, or a um, branch or anything like that. So we have to use this sort of lerp uh, control. Um, you could use select position from array. I did try this. Uh, I don't think it's possible to use dynamic inputs as the positions in the array, or at least I couldn't get it to work. So um, yeah, we're not using that because I didn't think it worked. Uh, so instead, we're going to use this lerp. Um, so how does this work? Well, if our particles haven't released, that's the input A, we're going to use the emitter uh, simulation position. So that's basically saying stay attached to the uh, where the emitter is. And if it has released, well, let's use particle position. So we're setting particle position to be particle position. So as it's going round, it's attached to the sword. As soon as it gets unattached, it now has a position. And because we're setting it to itself, we're effectively doing nothing. We're passing the value through. Um, and this means that this effectively stops, stops working, stops doing anything. So how does this work? What if we add this to our uh, class best release, to our system, to our sequence? Uh, I'm just going to copy and paste the attachment. It should work fine. What we should get, if I've done this correctly, oh, is nothing visible. Why is nothing visible? That's the wrong one. Is this set to be visible? Yes, it is. Oh, something's happening. What have I done wrong? Position, engine simulation position, position here. If the time journey is greater than the age, set that to be true. That should be right. Let me just double check the one that I made earlier. Time to list. Like this. A is going to be, I've got my inputs the wrong way around. Yes, I have. So I can do A is less than B. Does that work? There we go. Yes. So make sure when you're doing comparisons, you compare the right things and also compare them the right way around. Um, our particles have to live longer, have to be over the emitter age. Yeah, that's right. Is that right? Anyway, I had the inputs the wrong way around. So A is less than B. So while A is less than B, the time to release is less than the age. That is true. Okay, I think that's right. Anyway, it's definitely working now. So, so what's happening? So as our particles are moving around on our sword, if the age is less than the the thing, is that working? Doesn't seem to be. Let's set this up properly then. So. A time to release A greater than B. Emitter age time to release A greater than B. And what should happen is as the particles go around, yeah, they are spawned and released. And why is that not resetting? Because uh, of this. Okay, fine. So let's do a um, Niagara component. So the particle system isn't resetting as we go back. So the burst isn't happening again. So our particles aren't respawning. Uh, but if I add a Niagara component here and then a life cycle system track, um, that will just respawn them. So again, I'm going to give it that one frame gap. 
Um, and there we are. Now we should get particles every time we scrub our system. Um, maybe a little small. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Uh, initialize. So, so what's happening? Well, in the first frame, 400, how many particles are spawning? Um, then on the next frame, one of those particles, or the age of the emitter goes up, and then however many particles are now have their parameter less than the age of the emitter, other way around, um, then they are, uh, yeah, they're now old enough to be released. And if they're released, the position of the particle stops being attached to the sword, but just being the position as it is in space. Uh, and you can see we get one particle basically per frame. So the, the limitation of this is going to be that there's no kind of inter-frame um, spawning, um, but it's dynamic and it bases it based on the uh, on the sword swing quite nicely. Um, and there's another couple of real big advantages to this. So if I come back to my autosave, because the particles are spawned at the start of the emitter of the lifetime, um, we can actually save information from previous frames. Uh, and so what we can do is we can take the position uh, or save out the previous position of our particle and then use that um, current position and previous position to create a velocity vector. And so we can base our particle speeds um, or our particle velocities uh, on the actual motion of our sword. So it'd be very dynamic as this goes into different animations, all based on um, on what's happening actually there to calculate those values. So let's do that. So what do I want to do? Well, I need to store my particles previous position. Um, so I'm going to create this. Uh, well, let's not. Let's do it here in update first. So we're going to do a new parameter uh, and it's going to be a vector. Um, is it going to be a vector? No, it's going to be a position. Um, and it's going to be the previous frame position. Um, and what I want to do is the same setup here. So we're going to do a lerp. We want to store, well, let's do this Boolean thing first. So custom float from Boolean uh, has released yes and no. So if the particle hasn't released, I want to store the previous frame, frame, I want to store the particle's position in previous frame position. So particle position. So every frame is writing the position where it is. And then the, the very first frame after it releases, rather than updating this value, it's just going to default to, to being this value. So it's going to stay unedited. Um, I want to let me set to itself. There it is. Um, so every frame before release, we're saving that position, saving that position, saving that position. The first frame of release, we're not updating that value anymore. So we've set, saved this kind of like last frame um, before release, I guess would be the, the best way to call this. But we're only going to use it once, and that's as a previous frame. So, OK. Um, we're getting an error. Compilation failed. What's happening? Well, if we look at the log, um, particle previous frame position was read before being set. So we're trying to write to this position, pre previous frame position value, before we've actually set it. Um, so we can't do that because the very first time it goes through, it's going to fail. Um, simple enough to fix. We just go to our spawn and create a, or set the same value. So uh, previous frame position. Um, now that will compile. Now I'm just going to set this to be particle position. So particles spawn, save their position, um, and then every frame update that value. Now that's fine. That should be working. A bit difficult to see. Um, but we're going to use that value in uh, our, uh, our update here to set a velocity. So another set parameter. Um, particle velocity. And what we want to do, as I say, if we go back to our oops, drawing, um, this will probably do. Yeah, if we go red. So we have a particle spawned here. We have a kind of ghost particle in the previous position. 
uh, and we can take those two in the same as we did before, take the two things, work out the vector between them. And in this case, we aren't going to normalize it. We're going to keep it um, as the sort of distance so that two particles spawn really close together. You'll get a little velocity and two particles spawn very far apart. They'll get a big velocity. Um, and you can see that will dynamically update based on the sword animation. So point here, point here, vector between them. Um, and we're going to multiply that by a value because that velocity isn't very big uh, and we want some control over that. So now we only want to do this, this set velocity, um, the very first frame the particle releases. If we have it set every frame, what it's going to do is it's going to keep getting that particle's velocities um, and it's going to keep applying it and applying it and applying it. So, um, so I'm going to do the same setup again, lerp, lerp between two values. So lerp vector based on Boolean comparison has collided or has released. Sorry, you don't want to do any collisions. Um, and so before it releases, we want to set the velocity and it's going to be a um, multiply vector by float. That's going to give us our scale value and then subtract. Uh, in this case, it's going to be subtract positions because they're position values. And we're just going to take our particle position and subtract the previous position. So while this is not um, collided, while this is not uh, collided, while this is not released, we're setting that velocity every frame. Um, we'll just scale it up by a bit. And then as soon as it does release, we're going to set the velocity to be itself. So again, this idea of not doing something, so um, particle velocity. So once the particle's released, the velocity just gets passed through. It's being set to be itself. Um, so let's look and see if that works. No. Why does that not work? So particle velocity, subtract position, previous frame position, velocity, position, previous frame position, multiplied, that should be right. Previous frame position, position, position. That looks correct, that looks correct. Oh. I know why it doesn't work. Uh, when we're working in Niagara, um, I made the exact same mistake in the setting up this demo. Um, when we're working in Niagara, if we add a velocity module, uh, it will give us a big warning saying, you don't have a self forces and velocity module. Would you like one? It won't work without it. Um, that's really useful. Unfortunately, when we're dealing with setting our velocity directly, uh, it doesn't give us that warning. So um, the reason why this isn't solving or isn't doing anything is because we haven't given it the velocity solver. Simple as that. So if we go back into our system in update, uh, solve forces and velocity. Now, hopefully, if I click play, it should work. And it does. Yay. Um, so it's taking the speed or the velocity of the particles. You do get some errors when you're scrubbing, so maybe don't scrub. Um, but it's taking the speed or the, the distance between the particle and the previous particle, using that to then drive the velocity. Um, and what you get is the faster the sword is moving, the faster the particles fire out. Now, as I say, there is that limitation of it's only going to update per frame. You probably could if you were more uh, invested than me and and. and really understood Niagara, write something so that it spawned particles between those two frames. Um, spawn per unit obviously does it. Um, so you could maybe combine those two if you were really, um, really had to. But if we just slow this animation right down, um, I'm just going to set the speed play rate down to let's say 0.25, so a quarter speed. Um, now we've got a lot more frame data. And you can see there's a little hiccup in the animation up there where it suddenly speeds up. Um, but you can see, hopefully, the spawning between particles and also the velocity of the particles is all dynamic based on the sword's movement. So you get a really nice, um, yeah, dynamic effect. Um, it feels very realistic. The faster you're moving something, the faster the particles come off it. So it'd be really good for sort of water splashes, um, maybe some magic sparks, maybe more kind of like a magic wand type effect than a sword trail. Um, but 
hopefully that demonstrates the principle. Um, cool, I think that is everything. Let's just have a quick recap. So firstly, we looked at uh, spawn per unit. So um, default module just gives you a distance between particles to spawn. Um, and then that works, like I say, really well for car exhausts, those kinds of things. Uh, if you want to use it for a sword trail, um, you might struggle because of the speed of the animation. You're going to get gaps where the uh, velocity is not being applied correctly. So we want to make our own velocity that's not a linear velocity. Um, well, it is still a linear velocity, it's good to write, um, but it's a per particle velocity based on, in this case, some world data. So the center point of our character um, probably have to be code driven, but easy enough to set up in Blueprint when you spawn this effect. Um, and then either firing out radially, just by taking the position between the particle and the character, or firing out sort of spirally um, by taking the cross product to that previous vector. Um, and that gives us that sort of horizontal sideways motion. That's spawn, spawn per unit. Uh, other one, spawn burst, spawning particles on the first frame using a parameter that we've set based on time to when, when particles want to be released. Um, and then using the previous position of the particle um, to calculate a velocity. So it's all dynamic based on animation. Um, last thing, I mean, there's nothing stopping us using this uh, as sort of uh, a visibility tag as well. So in this case, we've got particles. Oops, I opened my sequencer. In this case, we've got particles that are visible on the tip of the sword all the time. It's probably not what you want. Well, easy enough to fix. We have data for that. So if I go back in here, um, we have this one here, visibility tag. Um, this tells the renderer which particle system to be visible. Um, and so in this case, this is renderer zero, I believe. Um, so if we just go in here and on update, we can do set visibility. Uh, what is it? What is it down here? Visibility tag, yeah. Visibility tag. So if this is set to zero, we see the particles. If it's set to one or anything non zero, we don't. Um, and so we'll just do a um, int from ball uh, has released. And so if it has released, we want zero. If it hasn't released, we want one. So this is telling the system to render uh, sprite render of one. We don't have sprite render of one, so it just doesn't render anything. Um, and now we get nothing at all until. Uh, until our time is elapsed. So now, well, it doesn't take very long for the particles to, to spawn in because it's such a, a big spawn uh, spawn time, but that has fixed the problem. Um, if I go into our spawn by here, if I make this every half a second, we should at least get half a second of no particles at the beginning. Um, uh, Okay, I guess we don't because the first one's ID is zero. Here we go. Always little things to fix, isn't it? So while I'm using the particle ID, let's use a um, add integer and do one plus the particle ID. Here we go. So the first particle that spawns has an ID of zero plus one, one multiplied by this. Now at least we should get half a, half a second of no particles and we do. Here we go. Um, so that is working. So. Hopefully that's been useful. Um, thanks to Deathray on the Discord for the idea, um, and I think it was Duke Law who uh, posted the original question about spawn per units. Um, hopefully they've been some interesting things you can put into your um, systems, or if not exactly this, some of the workflow about Niagara and using data and spawning and things like that. Um, so. As always, big thanks to my patrons for supporting the channel. Um, do like, comment, subscribe, all of those things, and share. Um, and yeah, if you've got any questions about Niagara stuff or Unreal in general, uh, either drop me a comment here below or um, send me an email. I do try and reply to most people. Um, 